five, four, three, two, one. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the city council meeting of July 15th, 2021. The time now is 8, 11 p.m. City clerk preamble, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This meeting is compliant with the governor's executive order N-08-21 issued on June 21st, 2021, allowing for a deviation of teleconference rules required by the Brown Act. The purpose of this is to provide the safest environment for staff, council members, and the public while allowing for public participation. The public may address the council using exclusively remote public comment options. The council may take action on any item listed in the agenda. Members of the public may view the city council meeting by logging into the Zoom webinar listed below. City council meetings can also be viewed live and or on demand via the city's YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Brisbane CA or on Comcast channel 27. Archive videos can be replayed on the city's website, brisbaneca.org forward slash meetings. To address the council, the city council meeting will be an exclusively virtual meeting. The city council agenda materials may be viewed online at brisbaneca.org at least 24 hours prior to a special meeting and at least 72 hours prior to a regular meeting. Meeting participants are encouraged to submit public comments in writing in advance of the meeting. Aside from commenting while in the Zoom webinar, the following email and text sign will also be monitored during the meeting and public comments received will be noted for the record during oral communications one and two or during an item. Email ipadia at brisbaneca.org, text 628-219-2922, join the Zoom webinar at zoom.us with a webinar ID 991-9362-8666, the passcode 123456, and the call-in number 1669900, Nine one two eight. We need special assistance to participate in this meeting. Please contact the city clerk at 415-508-2113. Notification in advance of the meeting will enable the city to make reasonable arrangements to ensure accessibility to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, due to the lengthy um, agenda that we have this evening, I'm gonna try and get us through things as quickly as possible. But before we start, would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item two, roll call, city clerk, roll call, please. Council Member Davis. Here. Council Member Lentz. Here. Council Member Mackin. Here. Council Member O'Connell. Here. And Mayor Cunningham. Here, thank you. Um, adoption of the agenda. Um, the agenda item uh, M, I am going to abstain from. I just wanna read something to you all, please. Although the city attorney is aware of the facts and has advised me that I do not have a conflict of interest in considering and voting on this contract, I have nonetheless decided to recuse myself from this decision. The vendor is someone I did business with in the distant past and we remain good friends. I do not want anyone to mistake our prior business relationship as having anything to do with the city council's decision whether or not to do business with her firm. And therefore I am recusing myself from the consideration and of voting on this council decision. So removing item M from the agenda uh, can I get a first and a second to approve the agenda minus item M? I'm Are we sorry, Madam. It off the agenda? We're just taking it off consent. Taking it off consent, sorry. And leaving it on the agenda. Yes, I'm sorry, I apologize. And then Cliff can put it back on and he can call that vote. Okay, uh, with that, I will make a motion to ad adopt the agenda. Second. Vote, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Cliff, over to you for item M. Oh, uh, okay. We're not going to pull the uh, consent. Uh, 
calendar item. You, you want to, you, Madam Mayor, we can go ahead and start with awards uh, and presentations. Want to do item four first? Uh, sure, awards and presentations. Okay. Um, Madam Mayor, I'm sorry, we should report out. Oh, apologies. Can we have a report out in closed session? Sorry. Thanks. Uh, item G before the housing authority on the agenda direction was given to staff and we'll come back to the housing authority. Uh, I do them backwards now and on item H direction was given to the real property negotiator and that too will come back to the housing authority. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Tom. Okay, so moving on to item four awards and presentations. Item A presentation on the new hybrid meeting format. Caroline? Thank you, Tom. Okay, so moving on to item four, awards and presentations. Item A, presentation on the new hybrid meeting format. Yes. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Caroline. and City Council Thank members. You, Tom. Okay, so moving on to item four, awards and presentations. Item A, presentation on the new hybrid meeting format. Yes. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Caroline. and City Council Thank members. You, Tom. Okay, so moving on to item four, awards and presentations. Item A, presentation on the new hybrid meeting format. Yes. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Caroline. and City Council Thank members. You, yeah, uh, okay, so City Clerk can. Can we find out why we're repeating? Was it only one year? Mm -hmm. Oh, God, are you too close? Me too, sorry. Okay. You aware of what's going on? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. We should be good. Dude. Do we have a sense of what was happening? I'm sorry, the reason it was happening? Yes, hi um, everyone, this is Caroline, communications manager. We had YouTube open in one of the tabs, so that has now been closed from the computer that we are sharing the presentation from. So I'll get started now. <laughs> Oh, so this is our first go um, at a city council meeting with our hybrid meeting format. And um, I'm pleased to be here today, even though it's been a, a lot of things to work out in the last few days, but um, I wanted to show you um, some clips from last night's very successful hybrid uh, meeting with the Parks and Rec Commission. As you can see, um, we have the community meeting room now where we are um, as one of the rectangles in Zoom. So um, everyone else was joining remotely, staff and um, a couple of the commissioners. And the community meeting room is essentially a participant in the Zoom webinar. So next. <laughs> we'll hear more about um, what's in this um, still here, but the cameras are being operated again by staff from Millbrae Community Television. So there's three cameras in the room. Those have been replaced with um, high definition cameras. So it's going to lend um, themselves to provide better picture quality. And we'll see that more as we have more in-person meetings um, with less people on Zoom with a share screen, uh, or sorry, speaker view versus gallery view. And then one more um, clip from last night. Um, you can see just the different camera angles as you saw the city clerk Padilla in the staff one desk. So last night we had um, Sarah from Park and Rec at the staff desk and um, everyone else virtual. So those are just some um, uh, stills from the meeting so you can get a sense of how we are going to be um, broadcasting um, in this new normal. And the the cameras are going to work very similar to the pre-pandemic times with different shots, depending on who's speaking. And lastly, the new meeting um, format allows for the continued ease for the public to join and engage in city meetings. 
It also allows for improved image quality, like I mentioned, especially that'll be evidence with charts and plans and things that um, just require more detail. Those, that will be especially evidenced on channel 27. And um, also it lends the ability for the council commissions and committees to take feedback from virtual attendees. And so I'd like to just um, see if the council had any questions at this point. Otherwise, I just wanted to show a quick minute, 48 second video for um, those that maybe have started joining um, city meetings during the pandemic virtually, just to see what it would be like to come in person and the different protocols for virtual versus in person. Any questions before we start that? And again, I apologize for that mishap earlier. Share screen and roll that video. Full screen. Yeah. If you are attending the meetings in person, here's what to expect. Before entering the building, please follow protocol. If you are feeling sick, please tune in online. Wear a face covering if you are not vaccinated. Disposable masks are available. Use hand sanitizer. Stay behind the acrylic shields. And lastly, enjoy your time and be kind. Here is how to participate in person. In order to participate in the meeting, a speaker slip will be available in the side lobby of the community meeting room. Once you have turned in your speaker slip, you will have an opportunity to speak later in the meeting. There will also be an allotted time to provide comments at the podium. You can participate remotely by watching the meeting on Zoom webinar. In order to participate, you can click the option to raise hand during oral communications 1 and or 2. You can also call into the meeting in which you will have to put in the meeting ID followed by pound. In order to participate, you can press star 6 to unmute and star 9 to raise hand. And lastly, the meeting can also be viewed live or on demand via the city's YouTube channel or on Comcast channel 27. For more information, please visit brisbaneca.org, where you can also find the meeting ID. Thank you, and we look forward to having you participate. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. That was a great presentation. Yeah, sorry about there's a dialogue box grayed out, but I one of the attendees had asked for closed captioning. So that's what's covering some of the, the screen right now. Yeah, no, it was great. It looks like we'll get more participation uh, from the community doing it this way. So I think that's fantastic. Thank you, Caroline. You're welcome. Madam Mayor, please unmute. Oh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, item B, moving on, a procl proclamation recognizing July as Parks and Recreation Month. And we actually get to use our new proc proclamations. So let me read this to you. Designation of July as Park and Recreation Month. Whereas park and recreate, Parks and Recreation programs are an integral part of the communities throughout this country including the city of Brisbane. And whereas our parks and recreation are vitally important to establishing and maintaining the quality of life in our communities, ensuring the health of all citizens and contributing to the economic and environmental well-being of a community and region. And whereas parks and recreation programs build healthy, active communities that aid in the prevention of chronic disease, provide therapeutic recreation services for those who are mentally or physically disabled, and also improve the mental and emotional health of all citizens. And whereas parks and recreation programs increase the community's economic prosperity, 
through increased property values, expansion of local tax base, increased tourism, the attraction and retention of businesses, and crime reduction. And whereas parks and recreation areas are fundamental to the environmental well being of our community, and whereas parks and natural recreation areas improve water quality, protect groundwater, prevent flooding, improve the quality of the air we breathe, provide vegetative buffers to the development, and produce habitat for wildlife. And whereas our parks and natural recreation areas ensure the ecological beauty of our community and provide a place for children and adults to connect with nature and recreate outdoors. And whereas the US House of Representatives has designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, and whereas the city of Brisbane recognizes the benefits derived from parks and recreation resources. Now therefore be it resolved by the city of Brisbane that July is recognized as Park, park and Recreation Month in the city of Brisbane. And item C, this one is a joy for me to be reading you this proclamation for recognizing Renee Marmion for all of her years of service to Brisbane. Hi, Renee, how are you? Congratulations on your retirement, et cetera. Hello, so, City Council, and I'm here in the chamber. There you go. So, so Renee, we totally appreciate everything you've done for this town for so, so long, but that's not in the proclamation. So recognizing Renee Marmion for her years of service, whereas we are here today to express our appreciation to Renee Marmion and to honor her for her distinguished 13 years of service with the city of Brisbane and her dedicated service to the residents of Brisbane as a Parks and Recreation Commissioner. And whereas Renee began her appointment as a Parks and Recreation Commissioner in the Brisbane Parks and Recreation Department on February 2008, and was hired as a part-time facility attendant in 2018. And whereas Renee's subcommittee work pertaining to events, festival of lights, recreational facilities, seniors, teen services, trails development, habitat restoration, and Sierra Point master planning was the foundation of Mainstay City special events and services for families, kids, and the young at heart. Whereas Renee also oversaw the evolution of the annual festival of lights as an event MC and host and spreading much needed holiday cheer. And whereas Renee played an integral role in parks and recreation projects, including development of master plan for the Crocker Trail and the city's signboard upgrades. And whereas Renee volunteered with various community groups throughout the years, such as the Community Beautification Volunteer Group, G3 and the Derby Volunteer Team. And whereas Renee has tirelessly advocated for the progression of parks and recreation programs, facilities and services in the city of Brisbane to enhance the quality of life for the residents. And whereas on behalf of the entire city council, I want to express my sincere appreciation to Renee Marmion for her devotion to the city of Brisbane over the past 13 years and wish her much happiness as she begins this exciting new chapter of her life. Now, therefore, I, Karen Cunningham, Mayor of the City of Brisbane, urge all of my citizens to join me and the City Council in congratulating Renee Marmion on many years of service to the City of Brisbane and wishing her many continued years of happiness and good health. Renee, you rock. Thank you very, very much. Speech. It's, it's very bittersweet of me um, to be leaving this, this area. I think I've sat in every chair here and this, this table. And my, my heart is in Brisbane, it, it always will be. And I, I leave, but I will be back. And I hope to be back and that trail will be done, the Crocker Trail. So uh, thank you, thank you for all the years of letting me, of, of appointing me to be on this commission and do the work that I so love. And I want to tell you, I started this. Uh, may, I, may I, Bruno, can you come up here a minute? One reason that I did, come around here. 
Those, <laughs> this is my son uh, for my for my own children because when we moved here, Bruno was three years old, and the recreation department was just so marvelous. And uh, I think he was in the tiny tot tricycle Olympic obstacle course that we had, and that's what kind of did it. And when we had the the first, um, I think it was the Piccadilly Family Circus, which was then turned into the, the, the Day in the Park, the fam community park and then Day in the Park. But we used to have it at the school. And, and the, the one thing that the kids loved, we put up little sheets across the fence and they used to crawl through the sheets. But the park and rec department was marvelous doing all those fun things. So that's why I came on to the commission to give back the service that they enriched my children with. So again, I want to thank you. Thank you for letting me be a part of all this. <laughs> okay. Anybody want to say something? Well, you know, Ray, uh, if I may, Madam Mayor, you know, Renee, um, you know, I just, I just really, really appreciate all that you've done for our community. I mean, there isn't a place, you know, you go in town that wasn't uh, positively impacted, you know, by, by your work. And, um, you know, we're all going to miss you. And, um, you know, I, I just want to say, you know, I really, I really appreciated the, those phone calls, you know, when you're kind of chewing me out and saying, hey, how could you do this or do that? Right. That's, that's what it's about. Right. You know, you, you, you you know, you, you're always one to be very passionate about what you cared about, and, um, and 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 you weren't shy about that. And I think that is one of your great attributes, and um, and it and it and it pushed us to 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 be better council members. So, thank you so much for all your all your service, and I wish you, the, you know, such wonderful happy times in, in Florida. Thank thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to say something to Renee or about Renee? <laughs> I'll go ahead. Okay, Madison. So, oh. There you go. <laughs> that double. Hi. She, so she hasn't been here the whole meeting, but of course, exactly when I'm going to tell you something, she pops up. Um, so, on behalf of Stella and I, um, we want to thank you for all the years, many years of service that you have provided to Brisbane. Um, I think there might've been an error in that proclamation because if I understand correctly, you were on Park and Rec Commission like in the nineties, right? Before 2008, I think you were on and then you went on a little bit of a hiatus and then you came back for more, is that correct? Correct, 94 to 98. Right, so we're talking way more than 13 years. Um, so I just felt, you know, we should let the record show that this is actually many more years than uh, what we had initially put down. And, you know, that just speaks volumes to the commitment that you have to the city of Brisbane. And, um, you know, I've had the pleasure of being able to work with you as a park and rec commissioner. Um, and so I know what that experience is like, and, and it's a fantastic one. And um, I have loved all the projects that we've gotten to collaborate on together. Um, I was fortunate enough to be part of the Park and Rec Commission while you were chair. And I always felt that you did such a good job in making sure everyone felt heard. You ran the meetings just so efficiently. And um, I was thinking that whenever my time came, yeah, you always use the gavel. And, and, you know, I took that with me later on when I was mayor, I had to hit it a couple of times because I was like, that's what Renee would have wanted. Uh, so, you know, I, I look to you in, in those, in my first experiences being in, in those types of meetings is how, how meetings should be run. And I always knew that, you know, whenever um, it would be my turn that you would help me along or that you would give me pointers and, yeah, I took so many of the things that you had done as chair and, and applied them later on um, on the city council. So it's been a joy, you know, to learn from you and to work with you. And, um, you know, while you've not been on, while there have been years that you've not been on Park and Rec Commission, you've always been dedicated to Brisbane and you've always been helping in one way or another, um, whether that's, you know, as a teacher 
or just lending a hand. And um, we also need to state for the record that we will be losing Brisbane Barbie. And that's also something that's very noteworthy. Um, <laughs> when I was in elementary school, Renee would dress up you know, as a Barbie on Halloween. And I looked forward to that you know, so often as a child. So um, thank you so much for everything that you've done. You will be missed. And I don't think there will be anybody who can replace you. There's oh. going to be no other Brisbane Barbie but you. So cheers to this next journey and um, you better come and visit. I will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madison. And you come visit when you go to Disney World. Oh, I will. <laughs> Colleen, I saw you wanted to say something. Mute, unmute, unmute. Oh, thank you. Um, Renee, you're just such a class act. It, it, it's really hard to imagine you not being there. And it, it's our loss and someone else's gain wherever you're going. And I would just ask that you keep that feistiness, you keep your sense of humor and thrive. And we wanna hear about your adventures going forward and just keep us in mind that we still love you to death. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you so much, Colleen. Jerry. Yeah. I can't elaborate enough on what the other council members have said. So I will just say, good luck. Thank you so much for your hard work and dedication. Thank you so much, Terry. Love you lots. We're gonna miss you like crazy, my friend. I just want to show you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> and thank you again. Thank right. you again. You take care. Okay. Thank you. Okay, does anybody else want to say anything before Renee disappears? Anyone? No? Going once? Going twice? Moving on. See you later. Talk to you soon. Bye. Good night. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, okay. Wait. Oh. Where's Clay? Clay? Hey, it's me, Bruno. Oh, Bruno. Yeah. I just want to thank my mom for uh, providing a lot of stuff in Brisbane for all the kids. Like she said, you know, she started this thing when I was a little kid. And uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> it moves. <laughs> And I don't know, I didn't, I didn't come here wanting to say much, but it just, I, I guess because she's my mom, I don't realize how much she does for everyone else. But uh, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive uh, that all you guys can see what she does. And it sucks losing my mom going to Florida, but now we get to go to Florida, so. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I, this is kind of, it's kind of crazy, but thank you guys all for working with my mom. And, uh, you know, this means a lot. I, you know, I don't really know much what she does. I just see it happen, you know, the gazebo and the park and all the fake flowers around by the Brisbane Inn and the Eagles and all that stuff. And it's, it's really cool. You allow her to do what she wants to do and she has fun with it and she does make this place better. So, uh, thank you guys for allowing her that. And uh, yeah, we all love you, mom. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bruno. <laughs> I almost died yesterday. <laughs> all right. I'll see you. Anyone else? Going once. Going twice. Thanks, Renee. See you later. Thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay, everyone. Moving. My last time. <laughs> all right. Do it. Just do it. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, moving on to item D, Postal Conservancy grant presentation. Inspector Preston and Deputy Chief Kavanaugh, thanks for being here and take it away. Well, good evening, Mayor Cunningham and fellow council members. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Well, let me introduce myself first. I haven't, I haven't met anybody. Uh, with you guys with the council yet. I just started with North County on uh, June 1st. My name is Sean Cavan. I'm the Deputy Chief for Support Services Bureau for North County Fire Authority. And so thank you for having us tonight. 
What we'd like to do tonight is myself and Inspector Preston would like to give you guys a short PowerPoint presentation on the Coastal Conservancy Wildfire Resilience Program grant that was awarded to the city of Brisbane for fuel reduction and wildfire, it's a wildfire preparedness project. Uh, what we'll do is we'll run down through, we have a couple of sides. We're gonna give a background on what the grant is and what the work's gonna be done and what the benefit is to this grant and the work that's gonna take place in the city of Brisbane starting next month. So with that, I'll turn it over to Inspector Preston. I believe he's on and we're gonna start the, the slide presentation. Thank you, Chief and uh, members of City Council. Yes, we would like to talk to you about the uh, Coastal Conservancy Grant and what um, what the benefits are going to be to the community and some of the things we're going to be doing. Um, Ingrid, do, do I tell you to just change the slide or how does that work? Yes, just indicate next slide and I'll move it for you. Okay, good. Okay, so we'll do next slide. Okay, so the North County Fire Authority, we applied for the Coastal Conservancy grant in April of uh, 2021. And what we were trying to do, the intent of this was to do a roadway fuel reduction project uh, on our streets here in Brisbane. And really what we were trying to do is to hire a uh, landscape and arboring uh, tree contractor to uh, trim back the trees off the, off the public way, off the sides of the roads and uh, reduce uh, the Viable vegetation and things on the sides of our, our, our roadways. And also removing invasive uh, plants on the sides of the roadways, overgrown and dead and flammable vegetation. And also one of the things is uh, clearing vegetation around all, all of our fire hydrants, which per the California Fire Code is a minimum three foot circumference around there. So that includes on, on our, our roadways. So uh, we were awarded the grant in uh, May of 2021. We were awarded $67,500 to be put towards this uh, roadway fuel reduction work with a, uh, and the work, work will begin in August um, next month coming up. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are we really trying to accomplish by doing this, by trimming and removing vegetation on the sides of our public roadways? Um, it's really, what we're trying to do is to uh, create a safer environment. If there were to be a wildland fire here in the city of Brisbane, for the evacuation of our residents. Um, you know, if there's a, a call that goes out, people are trying to get, get from the top to the down part of the city to get out of the city. Um, what can happen is the, in, in a major wildland fire, there could be ember casting. Um, uh, those embers could land in the, on, on the vegetation sides of the roadways, study the, the vegetation on fire. And now what's happening is the vegetation catches fire. You have direct flame and a radiant heat endangering the, the lives of people by trying to drive out, walk out, bicycle out down these roadways. So by uh, trimming back, limbing the trees up both ho horizontally and vertically and reducing the amount of vegetation on the side of the roads, we, we reduce those chances of things like that happening for people that are trying to leave the city. Next slide, please. Okay, and again, it creates that space. It does, it helps, it helps create that safe, safer uh, roadways for people that are trying to evacuate and uh, egress on our roadways. Next slide. Okay, so it works two ways. One, I talked about the uh, egress of people or our residents trying to leave Brisbane, but also what it does, it creates a safer environment for our firefighters and emergency personnel that are trying to uh, make access in to the areas, into, into our streets. And as you know, we have many uh, in the upper parts of Brisbane, many uh, narrow and windy streets, and we're trying to bring fire engines in there. So after the, the people leave the area, you have fire engines and ladder trucks trying to get up and down these narrow streets by reducing the fuel load on the side and also taking that back. It makes it easier for, to bring two fire engines driving down our roads and not you know, scratching and, and, and uh, damaging our equipment because we do have a, the vegetation that grows on the sides of the roads, both the trees and some of the vegetation up there. And we have some slides to show you just that as in, in the presentation here tonight. Next slide, please. So here's, a, here's an example. And this is on Kings Road. Uh, I believe this is actually looking east from uh, 150 Kings where uh, uh, former Councilman Waldo's house used to be if you're looking down Kings Road. So here's an example of a lot of overgrowth um, over the sides of the road. 
And this is actually one of our canyons here in Brisbane. So what we're concerned about is this, this vegetation catches fire. It's, you have flame and radiant heat. You have it catching cars on fire. And now these vehicles that are trying to get down the road, as you see to the right, are now have this flame and radiant heat coming down there. So what we're trying to do is, again, trimming back off the sides of the roadways, even past where the asphalt is as well, uh, doing vertical and horizontal limbing of the trees, and basically widen our roadways, widening the vegetation that you see there. Next slide, please. And this is also the same road. This is a little farther back. You notice on the right side of the road, you have a lot of uh, ivy under there, a lot of overgrowth, and uh, the tree canopy is coming over. The left side is the canyon as well. So again, trimming these maybe three to four feet off the sides of the road, thinning the vegetation, reduce the vegetation, will give uh, the residents a better chance of getting out and, and reducing their exposure to the direct flame and radiant heat. Next slide, please. There's another one. This is, I believe, on Kings farther down. Again, very narrow roadway. Uh, and on the left side, you can see the vegetation growing over. Next slide, please. Okay, I believe this, was, this one's on Humboldt, I believe right before Samet Hill Lane. As you can see, here, a lot of overgrowth, ivy, um, looks like some French and Scotch broom is growing in there. And as you can see, if this caught fire and catches that vehicle on fire, now residents that are trying to get down these roads are gonna have the flame and, and, and um, heat impingement going on there. So again, trying to reduce this off the sides of the roads. Next slide. This is probably the same street, I believe it's Humboldt looking the other way. Again, lots of overgrowth. Um, and just as a little side note, I know just because when you see a street and you see the asphalt, it doesn't mean that's the total street. A lot of our streets here might be 20 feet wide, 25 feet wide, but on the parcel maps, they're actually in some cases 30 to 40 feet wide, which is our, our public easement. So we have the right to trim back on those sides and, and, and widen our roadways. Next slide, please. Okay, this one's I believe on Kings Road right before uh, Beatrice. And as you can see here, lots of overgrowth, scotch broom, things like that. Again, widen, taking this back, widen it up. Next slide. I believe this is uh, uh, Glen Parkway. This is one of our canyons right here. This is actually not too bad, but as you can see towards the, the bottom there, where it'd be good, good to limb up and widen the roadways. Again, for fire apparatus coming in and out and people leaving the city as well. Next slide, please. Okay, another one, just another example. Next slide, please. Okay, here's another one again. Uh, this is on, uh, yeah. So again, you can see the left and right sides of the roads. Okay, priority streets. So what we wanna do is we, we mapped out the city and we created primary exit routes out of the street. And what these are is these are going to be the, probably the main streets that people are going to, once they leave the upper part, they're going to start to, to go down to get out of, the, out of the city. So one of the streets we identified was San Bruno Avenue. And what we're going to do is when we start the work, we're going to work on the priority streets first and then work our way up the city into our other streets. And we have a map of that just in the next couple slides here. So we'll start San Bruno Avenue, which is one of the main uh, exit routes out of the street. We'll start from Bayshore, work our way all the way up to Glen Park Way. Then from Glen Park Way up to, from San Bruno Avenue up to Humboldt Road. And Visitation Avenue from Klamath to Sierra Point Road. And Humboldt from Solano up to the top of Humboldt. And that would be about 204 Humboldt Road is the correct address on that. Next slide, please. And as you can see here, this is, this is the map. So the streets that you see in red are the streets that I just told you about, which are the priority streets. Those are the ones we're gonna work on first. And what we were looking at is all these upper streets that when people start to evacuate, the streets in red are most likely the ones that they're gonna to take to get out of the city. So those are the ones we're gonna work on first. The ones you see in yellow are the ones we're gonna work on next as far as the uh, roadway fuel reduction from there. And we chose these streets because they're probably some of the narrowest, windiest streets here in Brisbane and, and posed probably the, the highest danger. We want to, you know, we want to work on those first as well. Next slide, please. We're also working very closely with our Department of Public Works and our Public Works Director. And uh, they are going to be coordinating the vegetation and tree trimming contractors uh, throughout the city 
And they'll also be providing the guidance for us on the uh, identifying the public right of ways. Like I told you about the roadways on, on the map, even though a street might look a certain width, based on those parcel maps, they're actually wider. They're actually, the public streets are actually wider. So we're gonna work very closely with our Department of Public Works in identifying those and helping the contractors and doing the best job possible in uh, doing this uh, roadway fuel reduction project. Thank you, Chief Preston. As you guys can, as you can see in what he just talked about, anytime we have a benefit of removing or reducing the fuel load anywhere, that's that's a benefit and in safety to the residents, people that are using the roads. Also, it's a benefit and a safety measure also for all the emergency responders that are going to be using those roads. As you saw from some of those pictures, you guys know that area. It is there are some tight areas in there with that vegetation that's hanging over, and so and also with the parked cars that that are parked already um, on the side of the roads, removing some of that vegetation as a benefit all the way around. And we're open for any questions too. Thank you and welcome Deputy Chief Sean Kavanaugh. Um, Thank you. Really enjoyed seeing that. So do we have questions for Clyde or Sean? Terry. So um, when they're doing the clearing of the brush and the overhang, are they going to be looking at not disturbing the soils so that we don't have any slide activity that gets initiated by um, overzealous or, you know, removing of that brush? Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the stuff you see there. I mean, we're not we're not disturbing the ground or the root base. You know, there'd probably be at least a minimum four inch root base on the side of there. A lot of the stuff is just going to be the invasive growth, trimming back. Basically, it's 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 kind of like doing a little bit of manicuring. On the sides of the roadway, so we're not doing any major um, you know, slopes. Again, probably three to five feet off the sides of the roadways. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions or comments? No. Thank you for the work. Obviously, you did a great job. <laughs> so thank you. For, thank you very much for the presentation. Really glad to see this work happening. So yeah. when, when do we when do we choose the, the contractors? Randy, is that you? Yes, ma'am. So I, I was just typing Clyde a note, congratulating him on what a good job he and Deputy Chief Kavanaugh did tonight and asking him to uh, pick some time next week. I've already got a, our first contractor selected, so we want to meet and get their first week's worth lined out. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you very much for having us tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item five, oral communication. Um, we have a hand raised. I don't okay. know if that's been for one of the presentations or okay, oral don't. communications, but it's been raised for a while. Uh, I don't see a hand raised. Uh, Mikhail de Dejaid can speak. Well, I just wanted to update on this uh, matter because I know of your concern about it. We got uh, Friday night, got a message from uh, Khrushchev, which uh, said that uh, he would uh, withdraw these missiles and technicians and so on, providing we... This is bogus. Angel, shut this down. We... Uh... I like JFK. <laughs> well, history lesson tonight. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we don't want to answer questions on missiles. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Always something different. Stay tuned. Okay. I will. We do have, well, I'm sorry, Madam Mayor. Uh, we do have Roland has his hand raised and he is legitimate. I, Roland, I, go ahead. <laughs> thanks, Roland. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And, and apologies for raising my hand earlier. I'm still getting used to the protocol in Brisbane. No problem. Uh, so, first of all, um, I'd like to congratulate uh, Renee and Bruno for moving to Florida, but I'd like to remind them they may not get earthquakes there, but they certainly get hurricanes. I've been there. Um, but I really want to congratulate the city of Brisbane for being the very first one, as far as I know, who have figured out how to pull off hybrid meetings. Um, and if possible, I was wondering if you could post um, Carol and I Caroline's video on YouTube so that I can show other people how this stuff gets done. Otherwise, I'll just point them directly to a presentation to council um, this evening. 
Um, I also, I don't know if you can read the chat, but I'm the one that asked for the closed captioning and I apologize for um, any inconvenience. Um, if you don't want to see the script, you can click on the CC icon and then click on the higher transcript and it'll go away like it's not going. Um, and the uh, last thing, it's, it's a small ask, is now that we got closed captioning, by default, you get a transcript of the entire uh, meeting. And I was wondering if at the conclusion of the meeting, uh, staff could possibly click on save transcript and then post the transcript together with the agenda on the website for future reference. Um, the advantage of doing this, if you look for something that was said during the meeting, it gives you the timestamp and you can jump directly to the location in the video. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Okay, that was probably for oral communications number one, which is item five. Is there anybody else who would like to speak on an item that is not on our agenda this evening? Kim Folian has raised her hand. Kim, go ahead. Uh, good evening, City Council, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, after speaking at the last city council meeting regarding the public art ordinance amendment, um, I was insulted by the mayor's response that was clearly meant to intimidate the public. Joking about intimidation as the mayor did is not a laughing matter. Mayor Cunningham stated that my testimony was not true, although she would provide no evidence. She further denigrated my public testimony about a public art committee meeting because I had not attended. Yet the events I described happened as arts commissioners have testified at the Park and Rec Commission meeting of June 10th, 2020. At that meeting, council member Davis, who was mayor at the time was described as making comments about Michael Barnes with such vitriol that another committee member closed the door to the meeting room so that no one outside of the room would hear. Davis was vehemently opposed to having skaters represented on the skate park mural, and this political tension had an impact on the public arts process. This was the dishonesty I was referring to in my testimony. This is why I believe it created an environment where committee members may not have felt comfortable speaking up regarding skater representation on the mural. Certainly none felt comfortable opposing the mayor's attack on a member of the public in the arts committee meeting. At the last council meeting, the mayor also said some people only wanted skaters to be on the mural. This is false. Some members of the community who spoke at arts meetings wanted the skaters or the skate park represented. Yet there were members of the arts committee that were dead set against this. In response to my public comment that the skaters weren't asked about skating by the artist, again, Mayor Cunningham stated that what I said wasn't true. But tellingly, Mayor Cunningham never provided an example of a question that the artist asked having to do with skating. This behavior by the mayor toward the public is demeaning and creates a hostile environment that discourages mayors, or members sorry, of the public from speaking, lest they get the same treatment for holding local officials accountable. Public comment should be a safe space for the public. I'm relieved that the public art committee meetings are now being recorded as this will help keep council members on the committee honest and prevent their outrageous behavior toward the public that dares to participate in the public art process. Um, I will provide this letter to all of you council members and um, the city clerk and will include a link to the June 10th, 2020 Park and Rec meeting um, that covered my previous testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Are there any other uh, people who wish to speak on matters not on the agenda, Ingrid? I have received no further written communication or text messages, and I don't see any hands raised, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Okay, um, item six on the consent calendar, item E, 
F G H I J K L M N O. Um, I'll make we're a motion. Poll. Aren't we going to poll item M now? Uh, well, yes. I am not voting on item M. You're not pulling it from the consent calendar. Um, so do you just want to? No, no. We we are just, from we'll consent. just approve, uh, yeah, the E through L and then N and O if no other items want to be pulled and then. Okay. Second. Okay, yeah, that's my motion. <laughs> <laughs> Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. All righty. So then we'll go to item M, which is uh, revoke uh, original award of contract and approve award. Hold on, contract hold on. To Karen, hold on, does Karen need to go into the waiting room? Because of she's um, um, recusing um, herself. I believe she will just be abstaining from the vote. Right, there is not, unless there's debate, she can just uh, um, abstain. If there's going to be discussion of the item now that's pulled from consent, then Karen, you can make that decision. You, as I've advised, um, there actually is not a legal conflict of interest. It's a perception issue. I, I just feel more comfortable not voting on this item because of my relationship. So, so Sorry, Madam Mayor, you're abstaining from the item. You don't have to uh, absent yourself from any discussion. Just don't participate. Thank you. All righty. So uh, revoke original award of contract and approve award, uh, the contract to the second lowest bidder, Southwest Greens, for the dog park restoration project. Um, I'll make a motion to approve. Yeah, you know, I, I do have a question though, um, oh, okay. before we, we go into the, the voting. So Noreen, um, the, the, the company that we were gonna use, the lowest bidder, weren't you in collaboration with that company to help with design or, or is that is that a different company we had not gotten to that stage of the process with the forever lawn vendor oh, okay all right thanks all right uh council member o'connell has a motion so i'll make a motion Second. to approve item m entertain a second, second. Okay. uh roll call vote please Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham abstains. Thank you. Item seven, public hearing on Sierra Point Landscaping and Lighting District. Well, please. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pertem, Council Members. Deputy Public Works Director Karen Kinzer was supposed to be there this evening to present this report, but she hasn't joined the meeting. So I'm hoping that it's simply just a matter of lack of access to data or communication. So I'm gonna step in and substitute for her. I think that rather than going through the entire report, since this is an annual item, I'm just gonna suggest that we go right into the recommendations and we move through the process, unless that there are some council members who would uh, like to ask a question you know, ahead of time. Uh, for those members of the public who are listening to us, the assessments haven't changed since last year. It's exactly what was charged to the businesses out at Sierra Point. And the charges are so that we can operate a landscaping and lighting district out there. So Madam Mayor, would it be okay if we went right into recommendation and I'll start off with a statement of the engineer? Seven. Off I go then. So resolution 2021-54 appointed an engineer of record for the Sierra Point landscaping and lighting district and directed that engineer to prepare an engineer's report. Resolution 2021-55 gave preliminary approval to said engineering report for fiscal year 2021-22. The final engineer's report is attached to the resolution that council is being asked to approve this evening, assuming that you are satisfied with the comments you hear and satisfactorily answer them after you close the public hearing. That is the end of the engineer's report. Thank you. Yes, um, Opening statement by the Mayor of the City of Brisbane, July 15, 2021, Sierra Point Landscaping and Lighting District. This is the time and place set for hearing of the engineer's report and the levy and collection of the proposed assessment for fiscal year 2021 to 2022 for the Sierra Point Landscaping and Lighting District. These proceedings were undertaken pursuant to the Landscaping and Lighting Act 
of 1972. The engineer's report prepared by the engineer of works consists of the proposed improvements, the boundaries of the assessment district and any zones therein, the proposed diagram, the estimate of costs thereof and the proposed assessments upon accessible lots and parcels of land within the district. Any one of these items may be subject of protests or endorsements. You are asked to clearly identify yourself and the property owned by you so that your statements may be correctly recorded. The hearing is declared open and I will ask the city clerk to report on the various notices given in connection with the hearing. City clerk statement, please. Clerk statement for the Sierra Point Landscaping and Lighting District. Notices have been mailed and posted as required by the Landscaping and Lighting Act of 1972. Proofs of mailing and posting are on my file in my office. And a copy of the engineer's report prepared by the engineer of work was filed in my office on June 8, 2021 and has been open to the public for inspection since that time. Madam Mayor, go ahead and unmute yourself. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, is there anybody who wishes to make a comment or speak on this matter? I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Thank you. Second. Second, Second by Madison. Roll call vote, please. Councilmember Davis. Aye. Councilmember Lentz. Aye. Councilmember Mackin. Aye. Councilmember O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Thank you. Item two, consider adoption of resolution number 2021-60, overruling protests and ordering the improvements and confirming the diagram and assessment for fiscal year 21-22. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2021-60. Second. Second. Local vote, please. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lentz. Aye. Council Member Mackin. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Thank you. Moving on to item Q, City of Brisbane local stormwater program fees. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Nice to see you again. Nearly exactly the same preamble as the last public hearing we had, uh, continuing to have good wishes for Ms. Kinzer that it's simply uh, data that prevents her from attending this meeting or communication issues. Uh, noting that in this case, this is for the local stormwater program fees, which really is how we comply with the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System and its requirements as they are imposed upon us by the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board. Also of note, very much like the last item, is that the fees have remained the same from last year. So there is no change at all that assuming that the council passes the resolution after the public hearing, there will be no changes that homeowners in Brisbane will see on their property taxes as a result of this action required tonight. So uh, my recommendation would be unless the council has questions for me is to uh, start the process under item one under recommendation about opening the public hearing and taking comment. Thank you. So I don't want to open the public hearing and take public comment. I would like to open the public hearing and take any public comment that we have. Ingrid? There are no members of the public wishing to make public comment. I see no hands, text messages or email messages. Madam Mayor. Thank you. And I would make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Second. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis. Aye. Councilmember Lentz? Aye. Councilmember Mackin? Aye. Councilmember O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Thank you very much. Um, item two, consider adoption of resolution number 2021-61, a resolution of the City Council, excuse me, <clears throat> of the City of Brisbane imposing charges for funding the local Brisbane stormwater program, authorizing placement of said charges on the 2021 2022 county tax roll and authorizing the county tax collector to collect such charges. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 2021-61. Second it. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lentz. Aye. 
Council Member Mackin. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye, thank you very much. Um, item eight is old business, our Baylands planning process update and consideration of preliminary comments. This item was discussed at the city council meeting of June 17, 2021 and discussion will be continued. Staff report please. Oh uh, yes, thank you, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. Just real quickly, you did have a presentation by the city's consultant on June 17th regarding the Baylands planning process, as well as sort of a listing of some um, sort of objectives and potential project objectives that the Bayland subcommittee consisting of uh, council members Lentz and Cunningham had suggested um, be forwarded to the developer for consideration when they um, revise their draft specific plan. Uh, those um, sort of preliminary list of comments were attached as exhibit two to the staff report from June 17th, which you have in your packet before you uh, this evening. Um, we weren't planning on revisiting the presentation at all. It's really the, the, the council's opportunity to uh, review those comments. Uh, if you have any suggestions, alterations, et cetera, uh, we do have the consultant team available this evening if you have any questions. So with that I turn it over to the council. Okay, council questions. Anybody seeing the floor on board? Holly. Uh, actually, I, I just have four. Um, first of all, I, I just wondered if the developer considered having a traffic engineer examine the street configurations. Um, that would be to ensure safety for residents who have to cross um, various streets to reach destinations and also traffic calming measures um, in the residential areas that are um, particularly along the parks. So that would be my first. Uh, second would be looking at the shuttle route designated as phase one. It, it appears fairly close to the Muni station, but that's actually really a hefty walk for anybody with mobility problems. So I wondered whether they had considered extending the route to the Muni station of the shuttle. Uh, thirdly, it appears there's an intent to have large scale energy generation. And I wondered whether the developer has considered wind capture along the Bay Trail. And finally, I wondered whether consideration will be given to whether adjacent uses are compatible. And by that, I mean that there are commercial and residential areas that are only separated by a single street. That's all I have. Who's gonna jump in, Nicole, Lloyd? I think the point is really these are observations that okay. uh, Council Member Mackin's making that could be put to that list. I don't think we have to parse through what the developer's done. And I think it's the idea of putting those comments forward to the developer for their consideration, not responding this evening. Thanks, John. Any other questions or comments? Eric? I just wanted to say that I think it's um, a really very well put together list that the Bayland subcommittee has put together with the help of staff and that it's pretty substantial. And I think that once the developer looks at the goals and applies them to their draft plan, it'll come back for more discussion and a thorough review. And I think that the subcommittee did a great job. So thank you. Thank you, Terry. Uh, I want to echo what Terry said. I um, would agree. It's really, it, you can tell how much effort, you know, staff and the committee really put into, you know, um, outlining all, all of these uh, goals and questions. And um, so I don't have anything to add to the list, but I do want to thank you for your due diligence and your effort on this. Mm -hmm. Liv, do you want to say anything? Um. You know, I, I, I really, um, you know, I was, I was really thankful for the feedback that we've all given, really. I mean, it's been, it's been years 
in in putting it uh, you know putting things out there and um, looking forward to continuing the process. Yeah. You know, I have to say that um, I'm thrilled to be working, you know, with our staff and McCool and Lloyd are just such great guides. You know, so they keep us focused. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, any public comment, Ingrid, on this? I see one hand up. Okay. Roland, is that Roland? Yeah, it's Roland. And, and really, I have to apologize. Um, I really should have been attending the Baylands um, Committee, but I did not know about it until just now. Um, I just got onto the website. I'm wondering uh, when you got the pull down menu and you can select the various um, meetings, if you could add the Baylands uh, Committee to the list so that I can, you know, find all the meetings and all the agendas. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Any other public comments, Ingrid? I have received, not received any text messages or emails, Madam Mayor, and I don't see any more hands up. Okay, thank you. Uh, council discussion. Do we have anything we want to say? Doesn't look like it. Okay, going once, going twice. McCool, Lloyd, thank you so much for being here, and lucky you. You <laughs> don't get to say too much. Okay. Staff is being directed to forward the following comments and suggestions to the developer, Brisbane Development Inc. Thank you. Turn my page here. Item number nine, new business. Uh, item S, receive quarry development project presentation. Staff report, please. Well, just real quickly, um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, you do recall that earlier this year, the council approved the reimbursement agreement with Orchard Partners to allow for the city to recover costs associated with the potential redevelopment of the quarry. Um, that reimbursement agreement has been executed. At that time, um, the developer for the quarry uh, indicated they were gonna come and make a short presentation to the council uh, regarding what their potential proposal is. And that's what we're here for this evening. So with that, I'd turn it over to the developer unless you have any questions of me. Any questions for John before we move? It looks like none. Okay. Um, okay. Tyler, are you doing that? Tyler Higgins is here. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members, and City staff. We're delighted to have this opportunity to present our vision for the Brisbane Quarry. Thank you. As you know, we've met with the city's subcommittee on March 10th, as John just mentioned, and we were encouraged at that time to move forward to file our entitlement application and execute reimbursement agreements with the city regarding EIR and traffic studies, which we have done. This has been a long night, and I'll work uh, we will work to limit our comments so we can dive into any questions or comments you may have. Next slide, please. Here's a summary of what we'd like to talk with you about tonight. Um, first of which is introducing our team members. Second is to uh, tell you about the vision we have for the quarry. Third is just to discuss briefly some of the background involving the quarry's history and future use. Um, importantly, the next item on this list is the proposed project that we envision, the entitled process we anticipate, and then working with Brisbane and next steps. Next slide, please. Orchard Partners, led by me, is the developer. The quarry operator is Evans Brothers, Inc. And that's been the case since 2008. We brought in a reclamation consultant, Benchmark Resources. Uh, our biologist, Monk and Associates, civil engineers, Kieran Wright. Our architect is Ware Malcolm. Geotechnical engineers, because of the complex nature of this quarry, we've got two, Cornerstone Earth Group, and then Burlogger Stevens and Associates. 
creating contractor and reclamation consultant as facility gates construction, general contractor as DEVCON, sustainability, air quality, and noise consultant as RAMBOL, and legal, our land use attorney is uh, Coblins, Patch, Duffy, and Bass. Transactionally, it's Morris and Forrester. In past projects, we've worked with each of these companies and consider each to be best of class in their field of expertise. Next slide, please. Our number one goal for tonight is to share our vision for the quarry and seek additional feedback from city council to guide how we move forward together. With community input, the Crocker Logistics team will work to phase out legacy quarry operations, annex the development portion of the site into the city of Brisbane, offer substantial undeveloped area for open space as part of the San Bruno Mountain Conservation Area, redevelop with logistics, light industrial uses consistent with Crocker Industrial Park, address significant unmet need for modern sustainable logistics space on the peninsula, and importantly, provide a significant economic driver for the city of Brisbane and create diverse jobs. Next slide, please. Since 1895, the Brisbane Quarry has had a rich history of serving the needs of the Bay Area. This slide presents a timeline of its contributions, including the following. Quarry is located in unincorporated San Mateo County and is the Bay Area's oldest operating quarry. Quarry has supplied rock and fill material for many of the major infrastructure projects in the Bay Area, including the San Francisco International Airport, Bayshore Highway, and Crocker Industrial Park. Over the last several decades, there have been various studies and proposals for eventual reclamation and redevelopment of the quarry. The most recent proposal was from Summerhill Homes for a major housing project development in the, in the quarry, but this was defeated by referendum in 2006. Today, the quarry continues to operate under a county use permit and reclamation plan that has been reviewed and approved under the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act. The, the current quarry operator is Evans Brothers, led by Will Evans. Orchard Partners is pursuing purchase of the 144 acre site and working with the Silva Gates to ensure ongoing compliance and move toward reclamation, including an acting including an, an, an enacting an interim mine, interim management plan as we plan for the future. Today, the quarry is at a crossroads and we can either return to more active operations or move toward reclamation and redevelopment. Next slide, please. Uh -huh. This photo shows the quarry as it exists today. And I'd like to leave you with a few thoughts and observations. Mining operations are an interim use of the land. Eventually the mineral resource is exhausted and otherwise becomes uneconomic. The California Surface Mining and Reclamation Act was crafted specifically to address this unique land use transition such that mine lands are reclaimed to a usable condition which is readily adaptable for alternative land uses. Our proposed project implements this vision as a logical and timely transformation of the Brisbane Quarry to a productive and compatible development for the city of Brisbane's future. At this point, I would like to turn it over to my partner, Ernie Nodell, to describe our proposed project. Next slide, please. Thank you, Tyler. Um, you know, obviously, planning for a building in a quarry has some very unique challenges. We've, we've had to look at the geology, the bi biology, the physical nature of what we have to work with. Uh, the first step necessary involves reclaiming the quarry to allow for the different land uses that may be available. We'll talk about more about the reclamation process in a few minutes. But uh, coming into this, we've, we've got four primary objectives for the project. Number one, we want to resolve the long-standing tension around quarry operations. Two, we want to integrate with surrounding land uses and community consistent with the general plan goals of the city of Brisbane. Number three, develop an economical, feasible uses that contribute to the local workforce, economy, and city revenues. And four, we want to market to the need for modern functional logistics and e-commerce space. The first slide that we have here is just a concept. It's a concept of 
a two level warehouse building uh, that could be accommodated in the quarry, <clears throat> excuse me. We are trying to utilize the unique topography of the quarry. We can essentially stack two warehouses with different levels of access and loading. Next slide, please. Again, this is a concept of what may, uh, may be able to uh, accom be accommodated within the quarry. This is a two-story warehouse concept. You'll see on the left-hand side, there's a driveway that goes up to a lever, uh, an upper level. Uh, and this is loading on one side of a warehouse. You'll also see on the right-hand side, there's a car parking area. And not knowing who the tenant may be at this point or what the actual development will be, uh, we've designed it so that we could have multi-level parking, not in an, a, a garage that is, is up out of the ground. However, we can actually utilize the topography of the quarry and have the levels of garage go down into the quarry uh, area. We also have, uh, you know, uh, an ability to attract some uh, 21st century tenants uh, in e-commerce uh, users such as uh, FedEx, UPS, Amazon, Target, Walmart, any other national or regional or local warehouse and distribution tenants. We have some very significant offsite improvements that are going to be required. Uh, those include uh, rebuilding old quarry road that goes up into the quarry. Uh, we will have to have a secondary access. We're going to require emergency access and the ability for two ways to get into the quarry. We'll have to construct an entirely new road that will also connect into uh, South Hill. Uh, redevelopment of the quarry floor would allow for preservation of substantial areas of high quality habitat for potential dedication to San Mateo County Parks for permanent preservation. In addition, the mineral rights will be retired, ensuring no future mining operations in that dedicated area. Next slide, please. This is another depiction of what could be. This is a two-story warehouse. On the right-hand side, you see the lower level of loading and uh, as well as the uh, parking area that could be stacked uh, and uh, built in levels that go down into the existing quarry area. Next slide, please. These are just simple uh, renderings of uh, the, the elevations of each side of the quarry, the upper one, which show an upper level of loading. This is just a very typical warehouse configuration with dock doors for loading of semi-trailers. Uh, the uh, uh, next lower uh, depiction on the west, or pardon me, the north elevation would be the office areas and the parking configuration. Uh, the uh, south elevation, or pardon me, the west uh, elevation shows the lower level of loading uh, and so forth. Next slide, please. So the, ne the next steps, of course, uh, we are looking at uh, reclamation of the quarry. The quarry is regulated under SMARA, which is the uh, California Surface Mining and Reclamation Act. Uh, it's currently under the jurisdiction of San Mateo County. We have had very good communications with uh, the county in terms of the reclamation that's required for this particular quarry. Um, we uh, plan on uh, doing some significant grading, slope stabilization, revegetation, and other site preparation work as part of the reclamation plan for the quarry. The quarry consists of about 144 acres of land and only 50 acres of that is required to uh, create uh, a very uh, modern logistics facility as you can see in, in this uh, aerial uh, viewpoint. Uh, we're also gonna to have to go through a very uh, intense and robust uh, environmental analysis under CEQA. And we'll be doing that in conjunction with the city of Brisbane uh, the uh, environmental review will include various uh, uh, aspects uh, dealing with uh, the biology of the site, the, uh, dealing with the geology of the site, stormwater, air, uh, light, all of those aspects of environmental analysis will be undertaken. 
the agencies that we'll be dealing with uh, primarily, the lead agency will be the city of Brisbane, but we also have various other agencies that are involved with this, including the county, LAFCO, state of California, and federal agencies uh, such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. At this point, I would like to turn it back to Tyler to discuss major takeaways from our subcommittee meeting that we had on March 10th. So, um, as I mentioned, we had a good exchange with the subcommittee of city council on March 10th. And I'd like to just uh, share with this group uh, the major takeaways from that meeting from our perspective. We took copious notes and, and here's generally how we describe the comments. Uh, there was general support for closure of the quarry and redevelopment. There's an interest in open space dedication, habitat restoration and public trail access opportunities. There's an interest in creating an energy efficient independent project. Key areas for study include noise, light, aesthetics, traffic, and air quality. It's important for us to engage the community to get their input. Critically, it's very important for us to get input from the community um, relative to our project details, and we intend to do so. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it back to Ernie. So just the next steps, uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, so the next steps, uh, we have at this point completed various steps. First one, and more importantly, is we've submitted an application for uh, development and entitlement to the city of Brisbane. Uh, the planning department, we are uh, fully engaged with on this particular aspect. We've executed, as had been mentioned earlier by John, that we've executed a reimbursement agreement. This will provide uh, funds to the city for all the time spent by the city on this particular project. We have already uh, provided a significant deposit towards that, uh, that reimbursement agreement. And we've already kicked off a multitude of environmental studies, including biology, geology, transportation, air quality, noise, and uh, sustainability. The next steps, uh, very importantly, is that we, uh, the city of Brisbane needs to get an EIR consultant on board, uh, which is part of what we will be paying for through the reimbursement agreement and planning is underway, uh, preparing a request for proposals from EIR consultants to get them engaged, uh, hopefully in the next couple of months and uh, continue to move forward. Thank you very much. That concludes our presentation. I'm not sure if we're open for a question and answers. I guess I, sh I need to unmute myself. I'm I apologize. Okay, council questions. Thank you. Questions? Um, Madison. Okay, Madison. I it just, we're still in presentation mode. I can't see everybody. Sorry. Okay, okay go ahead. Um, I just have two quick ones and I'm just trying to keep it brief because it's getting late, but um, I've noticed like there seems to be just this rush for building biotech. And so I'm curious um, because I'm not seeing like as much dedication to distribution and warehouse sites or we're actually seeing so many of those disappear. Um, is the lack of that in the marketplace the reason why you chose to build this with that type of tenant in mind or what was driving choosing this site for distribution? So your question is why not life science? Or yeah. any, yeah, I mean, why specifically? Yeah, why specifically? So, so we've stayed in the industrial realm all of our careers. And the observation that I've made having bought um, a lot of different buildings in the Brisbane, South San Francisco area over time is that um, frankly, what you've seen is life science and residential destroy a lot of industrial inventory. And so that's been reduced by many millions of square feet. Um, at one point it was 10 million square feet of warehouse space. So is that, you know, it's a supply demand question, right? Uh, is there enough 
industrial logistics inventory supply to satisfy the need. You got all these consumers in San Francisco and all these consumers up and down the peninsula. And all of a sudden there's this new thing called e-commerce, which took off during COVID that can't be satisfied. So whether it's Amazon or Target or Walmart or FedEx or UPS or all these different folks trying to get um, packages to people, uh, my observation is, A, there's a lack of good modern space on the peninsula to serve San Francisco and the peninsula itself. B, um, there is nothing like what we're trying to design, uh, to build um, that could fill that need. And specifically, this site's got some very unique attributes, as Ernie alluded to. Um, it looks awkward because it's, it's a big U-shaped bowl, but it actually lends itself quite nicely for what we're trying to do. And what we think the peninsula in this, you know, San Francisco area really needs. There's a lot of people that are talking about, again, knocking down warehouses to build life science. And I just question how, when that music stops, and that's the, you know, favorite flavor of the day, right? Um, right now I, I can look at a pipeline of proposed projects that might be 2X what the number of tenants is today that exists for the demand. So. For us, sticking with the um, zoning found within Crocker Industrial Park, coinciding with that observation we made about what we really know well and what we might be tempted to build because it might be a cool life science site. It, it, it's not what we propose. And we took it, I mean, it could be at the expense, could be that we missed the mark too. Um, I don't think so. I think there's plenty of life science developments upcoming. And this is our opportunity on a fairly significant site to do something very special in Brisbane to satisfy logistics and e-commerce need. I had a feeling that's what you were going to say because um, we've had conversations with prologists, and they very much say that um, you know from their standpoint they specialize in you know industrial warehouses and sites just like this, and they find that you know it's just it, demand is just increasing, which. Um, strength, strengthens their portfolio day after day. And so, um, you know, there's quite a demand for this type of space um, close to San Francisco, close to the airport, and we're finding it uh, dwindle um, more and more. So I had a feeling you might say that, but I just wanted to, to check. And then my other quick question was, um, let's say you got approval to do the project exactly as it is. How long would you anticipate a build out would take? Let me just step back and answer. You, you mentioned Prologis and Ernie and I both worked at um, a company called AMB Property Corporation. And I bought all the stuff on the peninsula that is now Prologis. Um, they've made some other acquisitions, acquisitions since I left in 2006. But again, that's where we, that's where we, um, I spent 16 years with AMB and uh, I bought pretty much a lot of the inventory they're referring to when they tell you what they said about how special industrial is to them. And so that's, that's our frame of mindset as well. Um, how long do I think this will take? Well, um, if all goes well, and the stars align, <laughs> the planets too, we'd like to get through entitlements by the end of next year and then quickly uh, try to put a shovel in the ground and get going so that we could deliver a project by the middle of 2024, something like that. That is what we are striving for. We'll see how uh, it all goes, um, but that's our timeline. Thank you. I have a lot of other thoughts, but I know now's probably not the time to get into it. So thank you so much for your presentation and for answering some of those quick questions. Thank Elaine, you. did you have your hand raised? Yes, I did. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and, and also, I want to thank Orchard Partners and uh, Mr. Higgins for a comprehensive presentation. Um, I'm going to just be a conduit for the public because I had different people asking me questions. So I, I, I think it would be helpful perhaps to you to know what kind of things people were asking. The first thing is, is deemed a logistics space. I understand what you mean but the public doesn't seem to understand what you're trying to do there. So maybe that would deserve a little further explanation at some point. Also the concerns I got from people were whether the operations would be 24 seven, um, pollution created by trucks climbing the grade to the loading dock area. 
because it is a, a substantial grade and who uh, would be responsible for restoration of the habitat. I, I heard a lot of excitement about the open space, but there was also a bit of anxiety about, well, is it just gonna be those different tiers left as they are or, or what was going to happen to them? So I'm just passing that along for your information and thank you very much for being here tonight. Julie really noted, thank you very much. Okay, uh, Terry, did you have questions? Um, I, I too have uh, questions about the benches, the existing benches, because I know that in the staff report, it said that a lot of the restoration had been completed on those benches, and I'm not quite sure that it has been. And then also the, the current quarry floor has been built up with soils that have been imported, not necessarily mined from the area. And is it the intention of um, Orchard Partners to re-engineer that material? Um, and then I do have some concerns about the truck traffic and the nitrogen affecting the, the local um, growth on the mountain because with the pollution from the trucks, it does change uh, from grasslands to scrub. So some of those things I'm sure will be looked at at the EIR, but um, noises in the quarry tend to come out of the quarry and over to our housing areas. And I think that's a big concern for me also. Thank you. Cliff, did you wanna add anything? Um, I just got two quick questions, Madam Mayor. Um, how you doing, Tyler? Hi, Cliff. I, I know you've been uh, kind of kicking the tires for a long time on this thing. Seems like you're close to, uh, you know, pulling the trigger. Um, and it says in the staff report, you guys are in the process of acquiring the, the property. When do you think that you will acquire it? Well, if we're talking about trying to get our title mitts wrapped up by the end of next year, it's going to be somewhere around that timeline if we're, again, lucky to get things lined up. So... You know, I'm, personally, I'm very pregnant with this project and where there's a will, there's a way. And I hope there's a will with the city and we all find our way together to put something really special inside this quarry that's going to serve the community, put to bed a lot of the tension that Ernie alluded to that we all know exists. Uh, from a compliance standpoint, um, I think we've got that under control better than it's been in the past. So we're trying to be a bit of a white knight and um, do something really positive working together with the city and its, and its residents. Um, make Brisbane proud. Um, that's my goal. And I think that's a shared sentiment on the part of my entire team. All right, thanks. Uh, you know, one of the things in uh, the SAP report, it said uh, develop offsite infrastructure improvements necessary to serve the new development. But what are some of those types of uh, things? Yeah, well, Ernie alluded to a few of them. Uh, one is the existing quarry road um, that you know, takes you up into the quarry, right? That's gonna have to be all redone. And then if you step back, I don't know, Perry, if you can pull back to the site plan on page seven. Um, this is a visual that doesn't do justice to what I'm trying to suggest. Um, Sorry, it's page seven, Harry. Yeah, so again, this is a uh, hypothetical depiction of a two-level warehouse that's serviced by two different um, roads in and out of the quarry, right? The one on the bottom, the first level going down, that's the existing quarry road. And then we would propose a new quarry road further up South Hill Drive that looks a lot like what that road, should look exactly like what that road is looking to you all like. So there used to be a building owned by Dolby um, right there on Southfield Drive where our road's gonna kind of hug the property line there. And then I worked with Clay last year um, to pick up a piece of triangular shaped um, property that Dolby owned that the buyer of that building when they bought it from Dolby didn't need. And so the city's got that. Um, so again, this 
is this is our vision. I want to work with the city staff and the community generally to make sure that it's a shared vision. Um, but specifically, those are two uh, things that we think might be needed. If you're talking about things essentially off-site, um, whether it's a traffic signal at the bottom of the hill, that might be good. I mean, there's a I'm sure there's a laundry list of stuff. Um, Cliff that we can come up with that um, we'll all talk about as part of getting getting our entitlements. You know, um, I've heard since I got involved with this project that there might be a need for an interpretive center, as an example, to respect the mountain, right, appropriately, and help create something that would be of benefit for the community. When people use the trails, they've got a an interpretive center to appreciate all the wildlife that exists on the mountain. Um, I'm sure we'll come up with some pretty creative ideas to uh, make sure you know how much we appreciate this opportunity. All right, well, th thank you, Tyler, for that. Okay, any, any more comments or questions for Tyler? Ingrid, do we have any public comments, please? I have one member of the public um, raising their hand, Barbara Ebel. Okay. Go ahead, Barbara. So, um, you know, I'm very passionate about um, Brisbane and our sustainability, and I'm very concerned about our jobs housing imbalance. Um, and far be it from me, this isn't to say what city council should do or what the developer should do. But, um, this project, of course, is a, seems like a good project, but it's going to exacerbate our jobs housing imbalance. And I was wondering if there was any opportunity here for them to wedge themselves into the process and help us, um, I don't know, maybe just through their wisdom, maybe not anything tangible since it's, it's beyond the scope of their project but to help us uh, make Parkside a reality so that we can um, get that housing going. I don't know, I'm not, I don't have a specific ask because it's really kind of like an out there idea. I don't know how they would be helpful, but it's something I wanted to put out there into the universe and, and maybe something can come of it. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, I'll look into Parkside. Okay, Ingrid, any other members of the public wishing to ask questions or make comment? Madam Mayor, I have not received any written correspondence or text messages or email messages. Uh, Mary um, Rogers just raised her let's hand. See. Mary Rogers just raised her hand. Okay, Mary, go ahead. Hi there. Um, thank you. Just, you know, quick observation. I walk that quarry trail just about every day. And I take a look at that site knowing that this could be a possibility for our city. And that quarry road, um, if you're talking about, you know, multi companies coming in for, um, you know, deliveries, that road needs to be widened big time. And you need more than two ways in and two ways out. I mean, you're going to have, what is it, 100,000 100, square feet, multi-companies using this distribution center. Um, I can't believe that this won't be a 24-7 operation. Um, so sound is going to be a big issue for the residents, especially up on the ridge. I mean, we already have complaints about um, current companies in uh, the industrial park that are, are, you know, go, they work beyond, you know, nine o'clock at night. And so there's a lot of concern for noise there. Anyway, I mean, I like your design. I think it's a, um, it's a, it's a good project. I'm just worried about traffic and noise. Anyway, that's my two cents. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, any any more comments, Ingrid? I see none, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Okay, council discussion. What is 
What is everybody thinking? Well, I think this was just a um, receiving their proposal. I don't know where the yeah, presentation. I I, I There's think an ask done to approve what you need to do tonight. I mean, you, you provided input to the developer, unless there's any final comments on that. I think that's all all that was being asked for tonight. Okay. All right. So you're not asking to approve the attached agreement. You you've right. already approved it. You, you oh, already... from six three. That's right. Sorry. Yeah. Getting late. <laughs> that's okay. Right. Okay. Got it. Tyler and Ernie, thank you so much thank for, you. for thank uh, you presentation really appreciate it you take care we look forward to working with you thank you very much have a good night have a, have a good night good night okay moving on to item t we're getting there item t residential objective design and development standards oddds for future reference study session staff report please uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I'm going to turn it over to Senior Planner Julia Ayers to give a brief overview and then turn it over to the consultant. Thank you, John. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. So I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, tonight's presentation will be given by our consultants, Good City Co. We have Aaron Acknon and Nicholas Hamilton um, ready to present a status update as well as some um, concepts to get some feedback potentially from the council on in terms of the progress of this project. Um, Aaron will describe the project in a little more detail, but generally this is a, at its heart, a zoning um, text amendment project. We need to essentially change our subjective design standards that currently apply to residential uh, development projects into objective standards. Um, in order not only to comply with some new state laws, but also to kind of front load our own discretion um, into the actual um, development standards that apply to these new developments that provide some certainty both to the community um, and to potential developers in the future. Uh, this project is funded by a state grant that we obtained um, early last year. Um, so that work is being funded by, uh, by that grant. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Aaron Acknon for the presentation and update. Thank you, Julia. And thank you and good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I'll ask that uh, Nick start the PowerPoint now. As Julia mentioned, I'm joined here tonight with my colleague, Nick Hamilton. And why don't we go to the, the next slide? So Julia, I think, already gave a great background on why we're here tonight. We're looking at objective design and development standards. And this is a really uh, good opportunity for the city to put the city's expectations for development into the city's zoning code so that developers, property owners understand what it takes to uh, build a design, to design a building that is built well within Brisbane. Historically in Brisbane, as well as other cities around California, those findings were made at the very end of the process. So it did not create certainty for uh, residents in order to create certainty for people who are proposing to build housing uh, within cities. Next slide, please. So we started this process in January of this year. I won't go over all of these in detail. I know it's a late hour, but we've done two surveys. Uh, one of those surveys is live right now. We've also had a planning commission meeting. We've had a community outreach meeting. We've posted a virtual walking tour of objective standards in a neighboring uh, peninsula city. Um, and of course, tonight we are presenting uh, to the city council. Uh, next slide. We also have additional public outreach before this goes to the drafting stage and the public review stage. We have a community workshop on August 9th. Uh, September will begin the release of the zoning code updates and then the public hearing process will be begin in October and November. And I will plug it again, but if you go to brisbaneca.org slash odds and odds stands for objective design and development standards, you will find a survey, a photo survey that's open right now, and you'll find a lot of background material that I believe is very useful to understand why this process is important. Next. So usually we put these questions for consideration at the end of a council presentation, but we're about to take you through a series of 10 different photos um, showing developments in nearby areas, as well as what standards help create these developments. 
So I think these are good to take a look at now and we'll repeat them at the end as well. But as you're looking through these photos and as the public is looking through these photos, please uh, you know, take a look at what standards do you think best minimize massing and visual impact? How do you think these standards can maintain compatibility with nearby smaller scale development? I think one of the things that we hear about most in development is newer development tends to be larger and people feel that it's incompatible with the smaller structures that are next door or down the block. So there are ways that you could maintain compatibility through standards. What design standards best create active ground floor uses? So you have downtown areas that create nice pedestrian environment. What other architectural elements should we consider? So for example, I've heard, uh, I've heard from Brisbane residents as well as council members and planning commissioners that architect architectural variation is important as well as quality materials. And of course, parking is always a big issue. There's always a tension between parking and good design. I think we all recognize that parking uh, for the most part, especially in areas that don't have transit is an important part of the development, but also when you have parking, sometimes it takes away from good design. So I'd like the council to take a look at different designs that we show here tonight and see if alternative configurations for parking could make sense. Next slide, please. Um, so now we're going to play a trailer of a video that was uh, put together by Brisbane's planning intern, Dara Fung. Um, this is a great 45 second clip, but a full six minute clip taking through uh, taking uh, a visual tour three Bay Meadows um, is on the city's website. So go ahead and play the video, Nick. The first location on our virtual tour is a set of attached single family homes along Base Road that overlook Paddock Park. The majority of these homes are three stories tall with a ground level garage and two levels of living space above. Some units have a bonus level on top for a total of four stories. From the street, the homes look like two or three stories because the ground level garages are only visible and accessible from a rear access alley not seen from the street. Lush landscaping at the ground floor level draws pedestrians' eyes down and adds an organic feel to the space. Thank you. And we picked we pick Bay Meadows uh, for this, not because everyone loves every building that's out there, but I do think it gives a good example of different residential development at different scales and something that's nearby in the peninsula that people could visit. It's also a development that was uh, developed through a specific plan and development agreement that had very specific architectural standards. So now we'll go into our first um, example. So one thing that you hear in subjective findings many times is that the project must minimize visual impact of massing. So this particular development, the way that it did it, is it varied some of the roof planes, it had upper, upper level step backs, um, and these ones didn't step back too far, but it did create arti some art articulation on the upper floors. Some cities choose to set back those upper floors even further. Uh, and you see, as you can see, there's various setbacks along the facade as well as individual entries versus an apartment building that might have one entry with a more blank facade. Next slide. Maintain compatibility with adjacent development. Now that is a finding that we see almost in every single city. Um, and it's a finding that no longer could be there because it's subjective. But one way that you could achieve this is by having individual entries so if you have a street that may already have development that has individual entries, you maintain that rhythm on the street of having individual entries, matching plantings so that you don't have this break along the sidewalk where you have some developments with landscaping, some that, that don't, uh, that helps break up the uh, facade. And then a smaller, even smaller details you could call out in your code, like each development must have individual numbering that looks a certain way. Next slide, please. So minimizing vi visual impact of massing, of course, another important one, as buildings get taller, they have a larger chance at looking a lot larger and massive compared to the neighbors. So some things that uh, developments do, and you're gonna see a lot of repetition because a lot of these architectural features can help meet different findings or historically have met different findings, but varying setbacks, uh, parking and a garage. And here's an example of where a garage is hidden um, compared to the rest of the development and of course step backs on the upper levels. Next slide please. 
So here's another one, visual impact, stepping back. Once again, you can see smaller adjoining uh, areas and varying the roof lines, creating usable outdoor space, as well as varied step backs along the facade. Here's a different architectural style, style building within Bay Meadows, but once again, one that uses some of the same uh, type of standards. So there's parking, that garage that's in a single entry versus having it within each development. Each unit has individual entries, so it gives that residential feel to it and step backs along the upper level, as well as varied, varied step backs, step backs and roof planes along the facade so that you don't have one block building. You have a building that's broken up horizontally as well as vertically. Next slide, please. Here's a different angle. Many of the same architectural uh, standards were put in this including outdoor space, individual entries, and the other text you see on this slide. Next slide, please. Here's a different development in San Mateo. This one, I believe, is not in Bay Meadows, but once again, there's uh, specific standards that were employed. Of course, this development was built all at one time. However, each individual unit has its own feel. Although they look the same, there still is a different feel that helps break them up versus being all one color and one style. There's varied step backs, usable outdoor space, and of course, different colors that are implying different homes, which they are. Next slide. So once again, maintaining compatibility with adjacent development is a um, finding that you have found in many cities historically. You no longer could have that finding on the back end, but you could do things like having a uh, increased mass at the corner of the height and having the building step down after that. Uh, different colors and varied setbacks and roof planes along the facade. Next, next slide. So here is one, so minimize visual impact of massing. So, um, you know, some buildings uh, you know, that you have look very massive and look like a look like a block and don't have horizontal or horizontal or vertical differences in the building. So here, this one, you can see that projections were done at the second story that cantilever over the sidewalk in the first story. You have a large amount of glass. Now, one thing I think that's not done well within, within this development is on the ground floor, while you do have a lot of grass, glass, which is great for seeing out into the street and into the building so that you have see activity. The city uh, allowed late, allowed all of the windows to be obscured. So I would say that one standard that you could put in a building like this is not more than 25% of the windows could be, could be obscured. That way you do take advantage of these large, window, large windows at the street level for people having eyes on the street and people being able to look in at business activity. Next, next slide. Here's one uh, building in Redwood City. This building happens to be uh, across the street. It's about a four lane road um, from a historic neighborhood. And what the city required within the downtown plan was that the closest buildings to this historic uh, neighborhood be at three stories. It has to be set back uh, 40 feet and then it's allowed to go up another two stories. Now, this is probably a larger building than you would see in Brisbane, but you could still employ many of the same standards where you have a smaller area when it's next to adjacent uh, re residential neighborhoods, and then you step it back as it gets farther away. Next slide. Here is from a, from a different, uh, different angle, and you can see the individual porch entries. Um, and individual porch entries are another great way to have street level activity um, that you would traditionally see from commercial um, that you would not see if you just turned your back on the sidewalk with residential. And you also have significant step backs along the upper stories. Next slide. So here is an infill uh, development uh, in San Carlos. This was built about five years ago. Uh, this one has a more modern feel to it, but it is done with a lot with higher quality materials. As you can see, this one's actually four stories, but the fourth story is hidden and set back both from the rear as well as the front of the building. Um, San Carlos is lucky in this example in that there's garage, there's an alleyway in back to where the cars can be accessed from the back, which allowed a nice storefront to be built. And there's a successful clothing store on the ground floor in the downtown area, which is night. But multiple colors are used as well as usable outdoor space was uh, mandated within the standards. Next slide. 
So here's another angle that you could see. I think one thing that uh, I like about this building is many of the uh, street level uh, requirements they had for bike racks, um, as well as street trees, as well as a setback so that you've got a nice wider sidewalk in that area. Next slide. Oh, here it is. Here is, as you can see, that the city actually required that the building was set back a little bit more to create a wider street, allowed some landscaping, allowed bike racks, as well as uh, street trees, and still an ample amount of space within the sidewalk to meet ADA requirements and make for a nice walking environment. And these are all the type of standards that you can build into your code that are objective and understandable on day one when someone looks at the zoning code. Next, next slide. So here is one um, where there is, you could see some architectural standards. Honestly, this one isn't my favorite from a, from a color standpoint. I think they could have done a lot more on this building to make it interesting and make it make differences between uh, the different buildings. But this is one where there's objective standards employed, larger buildings at the corner, step back, there's some variation in the facade. And what's important about these is all of these standards for, and this is important when HCD and other state agencies are looking at this, is all of these standards were realistic and actually allowed housing to be built, housing to be constructed, and people to live in these homes. One thing that all cities need to be careful with is that objective standards are important, but you can't chip away so much with standards to where you're left with infeasible development. So that's something we're going to have to be conscious of as we're developing these codes as well. Last and so here's a maintain here once again uh, similar uh, individual entries act and then there's actually parking in the rear next slide and finally this is one again with a more contemporary look this is uh, in uh, Bay Meadows development this is outside a large plaza mixed use with commercial on the ground floor and residential above um, there's different materials and colors and textures on the upper level. Uh, as well as projections along the facade. Um, and there is certain qual high quality or materials that are mandated in the building as well. Next slide. So once again, here is, I won't repeat all these questions. Uh, the public can see them on the screen as well as the council members. Um, so at this time, I think we'll turn it back over to the council for questions as well as comments. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, questions? Uh, Madam Mayor, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, Aaron, thank you for the presentation and the great work uh, you and your colleagues uh, have been doing in, in our town. Yeah, yeah you know, very, thank very you. thorough effort and I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so the next uh, item, is the August 21st or the August uh, 2021 uh, community workshop. Is that gonna be a virtual workshop or are you planning to do something in person? So at this point, yes, it's still going to be a virtual a virtual workshop. It, um, I think we may end up having one additional one after that that hasn't been decided that would be an outdoor one that the public could attend. Um, but at this, at this point in time, the next one in uh, August is a virtual one. Okay. All right, that's it, man. Thanks. Yeah, Keep thanks. Great work. Terry, Colleen, Madison, comments or questions? Colleen, you're muted. Thank you, once again. Um, Aaron, I just wanted to thank you. I think the um, variety of different buildings that you came up with are really, really important to illustrate what the possibilities are. And um, I made a list of, of all of the things that, that you had pointed out. And I, I, I think they really enable us to have a, a, a rich variety in terms of many different architectural styles. So thank you, good job. Thank you. Terry, do you have anything? Oh. No, not really. Um, you know, I saw things I liked there and things I didn't. Um, it is hard when you're trying to do infill and design a standard for our existing smaller homes and what's going to be feasible 
next door to those and fit in with the character. But, um, you know, I'm not sure how many vacant lots we have that that would apply to. And I'm assuming that most of this um, is going to be for the, not the custom built homes, but more the um, larger parcels that come up for development. But also, are any of the examples that you sh have shown low income housing? So there are, uh, there within Bay Meadows, about 10% of the residential units are low income housing. So there is, there is lower income housing that is mixed in, but it's, an, it's built from an inclusionary standpoint. That's not a, we did not show one standalone uh, below market rate housing development uh, within this, uh, within the slideshow. Because I, I think that's what we need to see what, may be the results of what a below income, below market rate housing looks like. Yeah, we could definitely, is. right. You know, we could definitely put together some examples of uh, lower income housing, below market rate housing that was, that have been, that's been built recently within the peninsula and the standards that led to the creation of those developments. Okay, because I think otherwise we're looking at uh, sort of our pie in the sky of of having more um, market rate and above market rate. But thank you. Right, thank you. And, and you're correct. Most of this is going to be infill type uh, housing uh, in the downtown area and the SCR one zone, um, as well as some of the ridge line development. But there's only about eleven lots that haven't been developed in the ridge line, so there's. You know, it's not as much as some of the other areas of the city. Madam Mayor, I have a, two other quick questions, if I may, that I thought of. Go ahead. Uh, Aaron, a couple things that have come up before where you have certain, the stories in a building, um, there's a trend making the ground floor much higher than the upper levels. And that sometimes is problematic, as I understand from talking to some residents. So I think that needs to be clarified if, if there's a maximum for ground level stories. And also um, the, the secret development called a penthouse and whether those would be allowed, because I, apparently sometimes those are pushed through as ways to skirt around height limits. And I don't know if we're allowed to do height limits. Could you clarify that? No, you're absolutely allowed to do, still allowed to do height limits. Um, so that, that, that could be part of this. What becoming, you know, what I would say, not necessarily part of this effort, but part of future efforts is the state will look at the financial feasibility of the different standards that you have. And if they are too restrictive, so let's say you said you could have nothing more than a, you know, a 28, foot tall building anywhere within Brisbane state would probably say, Hey, you're not going to produce enough housing with those standards, but you could still, you could still put height limits. They just have to be uh, realistic and financially feasible overall. And, and Aaron, I don't know what you do if, for instance, if this is infill housing between existing homes, the ground level height, it might not be appropriate to be really tall, but if it's a standalone project somewhere else, it might be appropriate. So I don't know how you deal with that. Yeah, I think what you would do is you could put requirements for step backs within, within buildings if they're within a you know, certain proximity of existing structures. So you, know, you could have, you could require step backs from existing buildings um, in, in existing, if, there, if it's an infill development, and perhaps you don't have that same requirement if it's a standalone building, not, ne you know, not next to adjacent developments. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Any other comments or questions from council? Well, I'll just say like, I really liked that you had so many different examples and like kind of went through each one and how like you could implement different guidelines in order to achieve that type of look because you know, that's really what we're after, right? Is coming up with guidelines that are feasible for a developer, but also 
um, allow, guide that developer into creating, you know, something that you can live with instead of just every time they present something, you say, I hate it, I hate it, but no real clear no guidelines as to what they could do to make it better. So um, I do think that, you know, us exploring this is, is critical right now. Um, for me personally, and, the, and this is just a comment, but I really loved the Spanish style um, example that you included from, I think it was Bay Meadows. And I feel like so often we see so many craftsmen style and like ultra modern, like, you know, ultra modern examples. And so it was nice to see some architecture that was just like a little bit more uh, just di different and um, sort of classic to, to California. So thank you for including that example. That's it for me. So if there's no more uh, council questions, um, Ingrid, is there anybody from the public who wishes to speak? Yes. I have one raised hand from Barbara Ebel, Madam Mayor. Go ahead, Barbara. Hi, so um, I've asked this question multiple times and I have yet to get an answer. Um, but you know, we have those lovely Art Nouveau buildings on visitation and I'm wondering if it fits in within the, um, the capacity of the objective design standards to make Art Nouveau design part of Visitation Street. Answers, maybe? Through the chair, I'll actually pass this to staff. I'm not familiar with the exact yeah. buildings that they're, they're referring to, that the residents are referring to. Um, I think the fundamental question really is the city has not historically imposed architectural styles, whether it be Mediterranean Revival or mm -hmm. Art Deco or, or Craftsman. So that hasn't been something the city has imposed in terms of its design um, guidelines or guidance. Um, so that would be a departure and something that's a little more, um, I mean, certainly you can do it through objective design standards. It's really a question of a policy choice of does the council want to get into the a mandating architectural uh, finishes and styles of buildings within a sub area of town. You could do it, but that again, hasn't been our practice. Yeah, I guess that was my, my, my question that hasn't been answered. Is it, is it possible? And um, I will do my best to encourage the council in that direction because I love our, um, our historical Art Nouveau buildings and just for visitation. I think it's really beautiful to have a cohesive um, artistic style on visitation. Thank you. Thank you. Ingrid, any other members of the public wish to speak? Madam Mayor, have not received any email messages, text messages, and there are no hands raised. Okay, then everybody, thank you very much for this study session. And we will now move on to item U. Consider approval of resolution number 2021-62, declaring a climate emergency and initiating immediate and accelerated action to address climate crisis and limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Stop the court, please. Sustainability Manager Adrian Ethergen is gonna handle this, ma'am. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Adrian Etherton, Sustainability Manager. I know it's getting very late here, so I'm gonna to try to be very brief. What you have before you is a resolution declaring a climate emergency. This declaration emphasizes the severity of the climate crisis and the need to take action at the pace and scale commensurate with an emergency. It establishes the city's continued commitment to climate action and adds new focus on environmental and social justice to ensure that the transition to a greener economy doesn't leave behind those bearing the worst impacts of our extractive fossil fuel economy. Brisbane beat our previous climate action plan goals and achieved by achieving an estimated 20% reduction in emissions from our 2005 baseline by 2017, which was our latest inventory. Thus, the resolution establishes bold new targets, a 66% reduction from 2005 levels by 2030, 
and carbon neutrality by 2040. Make no mistake, these targets are very ambitious and will not come easily, but with focused effort and resources, we believe they are achievable and must be met to avoid the devastating consequences we will otherwise face. The resolution encourages all city departments, committees, commissions, and the council to consider our procedures, programs, plans, and policies to meet these goals and to develop a budget that enables urgent climate action and ensures a resilient future for all Brisbane residents. I wanna thank our Climate Corps fellow, Nyla Kusar, and the Climate Action Plan Subcommittee of the Open Space and Ecology Committee who helped develop this resolution. And to this council, our city leadership and the community for prioritizing our environmental efforts. Every day we hear news about the impacts all around us, the historic droughts, heat waves, wildfires. The climate is changing now, uh, faster than we ever thought it would, and so must we. So I thank you for your consideration and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay. Lots of questions. Colleen. Kim, thank you. Um, the reference to April 2022 as the first staff report, I was just curious, that's a specific point in time. It's not a year. How did you happen to come to that date? We like to do environmental things in Earth Month. So we uh, followed uh, other cities that have adopted such ordinances precedent and, and said we'd do an annual report in April. Okay, thank you. I was just curious. I knew there had to be thought put into that. Yeah, absolutely. Any other council questions? I, Cliff. Yeah, yeah thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you know, first of all, I just wanted to applaud the work that uh, the staff and Open Space and Ecology Committee has done to, to get this uh, before us. And, and I appreciate your urgency and your passion because it is like the greatest, you know, issue that we have to deal with as, as, as a species. And, um, you know, we have, we have some great opportunities, as you, you mentioned here, to, uh, to make a difference. And, um, you know, you're, you're a great pickup, Adrian. you know, to be on our, our staff. And um, yeah, you know, thank you for that. So, you know, in, in you know, the, the, the current action plan, so the balance is not included in that action, the current action plan. And that, that'll be something that will be, as we start to uh, get more information about the development of the balance, it will eventually be incorporated into it. Yes, that's correct. Uh, we have not updated the climate action plan because we need to do so in parallel with the Baylands EIR to make sure that the projections for uh, environmental impacts are consistent between those documents. Okay, and then you know, in the staff report, it talks about uh, you know, like before completing the Baylands EIR, is that like the completion of it or the or the the council finalizing it? you know, adopting it? That's an excellent question. Uh, I think we would probably want to have a council adopted EIR in order to, um, you know, move forward with that climate action plan approval as well. Uh, I don't know that that would mean that we wouldn't be able to begin work on a formal climate action plan, but I think that we would certainly want the approval of, of the EIR to come first. Yes, sir, we'd want right. it certified by the council first. Okay, cool. And then, the, you know, the emergency declaration, you guys are uh, mm -hmm. thinking that that would be a, a, a really helpful tool for uh, potential funding that, that could be coming down the line in some of the federal uh, actions um, in Congress. You know, stuff that we've, we're starting to hear right now that they might, uh, you know, be talking about uh, debating uh, next week. Is that, is, that, is that part of the other reason why you want to uh, move forward with this at this this time? It, it is. Um, you know, we've seen in the past different grants and, and other funding sources require that cities have established targets or, um, you know, action plans. And so in the absence of having an updated climate action plan beyond the, the 2020 uh, time horizon that we currently have, uh, we hope that this interim step will help us to demonstrate that the city is committed to continued climate action and has established some targets formally. All right, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Okay, any other questions for Adrian? I see none. Um, Ingrid, do we have any public comment on this item? Madam Mayor, have received, I have not received any email messages, text messages, or, and I don't see any hands up. Okay. Council discussion on this? Motion to approve resolution number 2021-62. Second. Well, Coco. Council member Davis. Aye. Council member Lentz. Aye. Council member Mackin. Aye. Council member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Cunningham. Aye. Thank you. Moving on to item V. I don't think we've ever gotten to a V before. Well, I haven't anyway. Discuss SB 1383 implementation. Senate Bill 1383 is a prescriptive organic waste reduction mandate. Staff report, please. Yes, ma'am. Randy Bro, back again for the final public okay. works item on your agenda this evening. Uh, Madam Mayor, would you like me to go through the staff report quickly or would you like to take a moment to perhaps consider extending your meeting? I, we're coming up on the, uh, we're at 1026, I think on my clock. You know, can we, yes, I will, I'd like to extend the meeting for 30 minutes. I think we can get through this in 30 minutes, but I would like a two minute break, please. I'll make a motion to approve the to extend the meeting to eleven o'clock. Return at ten thirty. Okay, we're good. Yep. See you in a few minutes. Two minutes.
Okay, are we all back? Looks like it. So let me uh, go back to, Ingrid, are we back to recording and ready to go? Yes, Madam Mayor, we're ready to go. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, item V, discuss SB 1383. Randy, you made a comment. I'm sorry, I forgot what you said. No, oh, ma'am. I, I was asking if the council was interested in doing what you did earlier. So that was great. So I'm, so I'm glad we all uh, have extended the meeting for a few minutes and that uh, we've all had a comfort break. So that's lovely. So okay. again, recognizing the hour, I don't want to belabor this item, but let, let me get to the end, if you will, first. I'll tell you why I put this on your agenda at this point in time, is that the requirements of SB 1383, while they can be simplified into five main components, are actually quite lengthy as a result of the legislation that was passed and as a result of the Office of Administrative Law approving many of the requirements that Cal Recycle came up with, the ordinances that we're gonna to have to bring to you before the end of this cal calendar year are, are somewhat lengthy in detail. So for instance, the first one we have to do is an organic waste reduction. When I received the template from Cal Recycle, it was 75 pages long. So I've whittled that down to 25 pages uh, the procurement policy is also somewhat lengthy, not quite as long as that. But one of the things that I would suggest respectfully to the council, if you have some time during your recess, and if you haven't had a chance to go through the PowerPoint from Cal Recycle that I've attached to this report, I think it would be really useful for you to do it. And I would encourage any of you, if you have questions, and this includes members of the public, please feel free to call me. I don't have any summer vacations planned. I'm not, I'm not going on vacation or going anywhere until October. I would love to talk with people about it so that when we bring these lengthy ordinances to you, as you read through them, they will make much more sense if you familiarize yourself. So with that, I just want to hit the five items that really what we're trying to do with SB 1383, what the law is trying to do, is they are trying to get us to reduce the amount of organic waste that we send out to landfills that then turns into methane. It's one of the greatest contributors to greenhouse gas. And it's just because we're throwing away food that can either be reused, reprocessed, recovered, or converted in some other way. So in the middle of the staff report, you'll see there's five line items there. The, really the big five components are provide organic collection to all residents and business. Right now, the green bins are an option unless you produce more than four cubic yards of waste a week. But any, every residence, every home can request one if you want one. It's really simple once you get into the mode of it and learning what to put in there. The second thing we have to do is participate in an edible food recovery program. There's actually already an incredibly, really strong and viable edible food recovery program in San Mateo County right now. The County of uh, San Mateo operates it out of their Office of Sustainability, and they will be operating it going forward once we get into the next year, we will enter into an MOU with the county to do that. Uh, the third item is conduct education and outreach. That will be done by your staff. That'll be done primarily by Ms. Etherton. She will be doing uh, that education and outreach for you. The fourth item, procure recyclable and recovered organic products. That is another ordinance we will have to bring to you. And actually we're already doing really, really well on that right now for two reasons. Number one, we've been buying most of our recycled content paper as it is, and we just need to make sure that it's happening throughout all of the departments. Uh, and the other thing that's been happening, and it's really speaks incredibly well to South San Francisco scavengers, is that when they many years ago produced a system where they can uh, create recycled natural gas, that credit that we will get because of them doing that will cover all of the tickets that we have to have, all of the credits that we have to meet for purchasing uh, recoverable type items. And then lastly, we have to monitor compliance and conduct enforcement. That's really the most interesting part uh, for me. We, two years from now, three years from now, we, someone, uh, either city staff or our franchisees is going to have to be going through and on a scheduled basis, checking the contents of bins to make sure that people are properly recycling. So 
That in conjunction with the education and outreach we're doing, hopefully will not be too painful, but we will have to be going through and making sure that people are sorting properly. And then we're gonna to have to go through and do very much like we do now with the trash container management policy, where we give people notices and we give warnings. And if we finally get to the point where someone is non-compliant, we have our administrative citations that we have to go for. So with that, I'd be happy to take council's uh, question or I'd be happy to let you go on to your next item and look forward to hearing questions from you later this summer if you have them. Any questions for Randy? You know, just one real quick one, Madam Mayor. So I didn't know that so the green bins were optional, that, that they were just part of, uh, you know, if you're in central Brisbane, you just, you have to have one. Or you, or, you, know, you don't have to, yeah. you, you don't have to have one, but I think the difference between Central Brisbane and the Northeast Ridge is that in Central Brisbane, the overwhelming majority of the parcels and lots there have some sort of vegetation. So you always have grass clippings and leaves and stuff. Yeah. Whereas if you're living up uh, in the Northeast Ridge where the grass and the trees are managed either by the property manager or, well, they're all managed by the property manager. Every single one of them up there is done by at least the front lawns. So perhaps some of the single family homes where they have lawns in the back that they have to manage, they may or may not choose to have it because it's just, it's a little bit of grass, uh, but it's not mandatory right now. It, it will be in two years, it will be mandatory that everybody have it. All right, and then, and then the multi-units at the Ridge, they, they don't, right now they don't, even if they wanted to do it, they couldn't do it, right? To sort their food waste and put it in a There is not a green thing. container uh, policy for them up there. And that's one of the things we're gonna have to work with. That's really one of the more challenging ones really when you get into multifamily dwellings is how do you put it? It's not only providing a place for them to do it. It's figuring out if someone's not putting the right material in there, who, who do you point the finger at to fix it? That, mm -hmm. That's really the most challenging part. And, I and, and we're still in conversation with our franchisees about it. We think some of that just may be is we may just have to recognize that we may have to go back and look at the rates we charge. And we may just have to charge different rates for multifamily dwellings because it may get to the point where it's just unmanageable to do anything other than having to take that trash from a multifamily dwelling and sort it at either a scavenger or ecology facility. Because to get compliance, particularly when you have dozens and dozens of tenants it is nearly impossible. It's like, if you come to my house, you can like, Randy, those are your trash containers. We've got a serial number on it. It's yours. You're the one. Stop putting your plastic in the organic. Okay. Knock it off. But when you've, when you've got a large bin and you're collecting, you, you have no control over it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, any other questions for Randy? Ingrid, do we have any members of the public who have any questions on this item? Madam Mayor, I don't see any hands up. I don't. I haven't received any messages, emails, or texts. I'd make a motion. Oh well, we don't even need a motion. No. Or it's just discussion. We just say thank you. Yeah, thank. You. Thank you. Enthusiasm, Randy, on this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Glad to be of service. Okay. Um, item ten: Staff reports. W City Managers report on upcoming activities. Over to you, Mr. Holstein. Okay, we will be very brief this evening. Um, I think I need to get the get this shared, Ingrid. Here we go. Go on to the next slide. Okay, we have uh, three remaining um, Friday night uh, activities at the park uh, through uh, for our um, Parks and Recreation Month. Tomorrow night's children's concert, 5.30, July 23rd, the mini golf from 4 to 8 p.m. and July 30th, the cornhole tournament. Next slide. Um, August 4th at 6 p.m., Caltrans will be having a virtual scoping meeting for their 101 managed lanes project north of 380. Uh, the public comment period opens next week and will stay open for 45 days. Uh, this is only the environmental phase. Construction is not estimated to take place until 2027. Uh, we will be sharing more from Caltrans next week on our various uh, media sites. Uh, please sign up for and receive updates from the city via our last weekly blast, brisbaneca.org slash subscribe. And that's it for tonight.
Thank you, Clay. Um, okay, moving on to item 11X, creation of ad hoc subcommittee for transportation demand management policy. Uh, due to the late hour, this uh, item has been, um, was not discussed at the June 17th meeting and was brought up to this, this meeting. So staff report, please. Yeah, so this is an item, um, you have a demand management policy that's very um, dated at this point. Um, San Mateo County through CCAG is going through a process to update the, uh, the countywide um, uh, ordinance that, uh, that kind of creates the base from which we all operate from. Um, we have a number of potential projects that may be coming through the uh, planning pipeline. Um, and so the thought was to have a couple of council members uh, work with staff, review um, what's uh, likely to be in place from CCAG and see if there's um, some updated language we want for our own ordinance as, as well as our um, own um, um, kind of approach to, on this. So that was the idea. And uh, um, I'll just turn it back over to the mayor unless there's any questions. Um, Clay, does it make sense for me to be on this because I'm on CCAG or is it better to have fresh eyes? There's, there, there would be no reason for you not to be on it because you're on CK, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, who, who else wants to volunteer then? There's a question. Yeah, I'd like to do it. You know, okay. uh, being on uh, commute.org and they're kind of like the go-to for TDMs in the county. How's everybody feel about that? Thumbs up? How do you guys volunteer yourselves? Because you were the two I thought would be good for this. Thank you so much, Madison. <laughs> Any objections? No, I see none. Okay, so um, is there anybody from the public wish to speak on this, Ingrid? I see no raised hands, text or email messages, Madam Mayor. Okay, is there a first and second to create ad hoc subcommittee for transportation demand management policy with members Cunningham and Glentz? So moved. Second. Okay, roll call vote. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. And Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Okay, what did I just do to myself? Thanks. Okay, moving on to item Y designation of voting delegates and alternates to the League of California Cities Annual Conference, September 22 to 20. For 2021. Is this conference a um, all virtual? No, it's not. It's in person. And can I get your approval to be the voting delegate to the League of California Cities Annual Conference? I plan to attend on Friday, September 24th only, so I can vote on our behalf. Where's the conference being held? Sacramento. Oh, the voting's on Friday? Yeah. Oh, wait, wait, tell me the dates. What 20, is it like a Wednesday? No, it's like the 22nd to 24. The days of the week is like a Wednesday through a Friday. Wednesday, Wednesday through Friday. That's yeah. what I thought. I remember when I was mayor, it was mayor and mayor pro tem, I think, and I just went and did it. Yeah. So I'm just driving up to vote and coming straight back. I'm not going to sit to the conference this year. But it is, it is open. I so, say that the mayor should be the voting delegate. I can. I agree. Okay. Do we do we need a first and second on this, or just a thumbs up? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Good. All right. Um, item Z: Countywide assignments and subcommittee reports. A A City Count. Okay. Sorry. Reports. Who's reporting out? I don't think I had any since our last meeting. Unless I'm missing something. Colleen? Peninsula Clean Energy, I'll be quick. Remember this, this title, Power on Peninsula. Very simple. If you're considering solar, Sunrun works with Peninsula Clean Energy. They put solar on your roof. They also have energy storage. What happens is when we get after hours, Peninsula Clean Energy can tell Sunrun, we need some of that energy stored at so-and-so's house. 
and they're able to dispatch it elsewhere. You get a good deal on the solar, and on top of that, PCE will give you $1,250. That's substantial if you're considering solar. So again, it's called Power on Peninsula. Look at the um, PCE website. And other than that, I can tell you two other quick facts. We're back to energy usage similar to 2019 now. And the new Joint Powers Authority of Community Choice programs now has 10 members because Valley Clean Energy and Clean Power San Francisco have joined. So that's big. Madison, did you have anything? Uh, yeah, I had LunaFest with Terry and we just, it's just, you know, updating each other. There's not really anything to report. We're working on LunaFest, that's it. Okay. Then we had public art, you and I. Um, and <laughs> we just talked about the implementation guidelines, kind of recapped for the committee what um, was discussed at the council meeting. And then we just talked about, you know, if we are able to use the fund for things like performing arts or temporary art, local art shows, education, that sort of thing. Um, so we're planning to discuss the work plan at the next meeting. And that is it for me. I don't think I really had any. Um... Yeah, I think I'm. I'm, I'm okay. And I had public arts and Madison covered it beautifully. So we're good to go. Now we start back at the alphabet at A. A. <clears throat> city Council meeting schedule. The City Council meetings of August 5, 19, and September 2 are cancelled as planned. And we also want to propose to cancel our September 16 meeting in. in observance of Yom Kippur and hold our next city council meeting on September 23rd. So mayor, based on the conversation we had earlier this evening, um, we will probably be scheduling um, a meeting if there may be both closed and open session, um, but we'll work with your calendars to uh, set that up as soon as we're prepared or as soon as we're ready to do that. Okay, sounds good, thanks. Um, item B, B, written communications. City clerk, can you please read the list of correspondence? Yes, Madam Mayor, we got Roland LeBrun from June 17th, executive order N-28, N-8-21, paragraph 42, Karen Lentz, 623-21 with gratitude. Renee Marmion, 630-21, resignation of Park and Rec Commission. Karen Lenz, 7621, library installation. Juliana Romero, 7821, regarding the YMCA community information. Linda Detmer, 71221, Bank of America. Ernest Ibarra, 71321, resignation from CSSC. Linda Detmer, 71321, Bank of America. John Colley, 71421, drought state of emergency. Seppi Wood, 71521, water update. Thank you. Okay, we are now at item 12, oral communications number two. Do we have anybody who wishes to address the city council? I see no hands, Madam Mayor, no text and no email messages as well. Great, then guess what? We are at item 13, adjournment. The meeting of July 15th is now adjourned until the next city council meeting of September 23rd, 2021. Everybody have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Happy Thanks. summer. <laughs> Bye.